So we'd like to quickly move ahead. This is on the topic, navigating the cloud native security landscape. And uh, to lead us through this session, we have our session speakers with us. Wherever you're seated, you can wave at us. Mr. Himanshu Kumar Das, Chief Information Security Officer. Cred, everybody, give him a round of applause. Mr. Himanshu, you're requested to sit exactly where you can see your photograph on the screen, right in front, please. Thank you. I'd like to request Agni Deepta Sarkar. Agni Deepta Sarkar with us, everybody. Group Chief Information Security Officer, Biocon, joining us here today. Let's give a big hand for Mr. Agni Deepta Sarkar here. Thank you, sir. We have with us Jackson Fernandez. Vice President, Information Security and ICT Governance, Bangalore International Airport. Tumka impol on bari santos salo. Tumka hi adar so swagat pateta. He doesn't understand Konkani, so that went waste. Well, I'd like to invite on to the stage Miss Suma Shamanna, everybody. Let's welcome her with a round of applause. Chief Information Security Officer, Democrats Abroad, joining us here today. And I'm delighted to say that she's the second lady panelist here. And I want all of you to applaud for a round of applause once again. Thank you. I'd like to invite onto the stage the session chair, Mr. Benoy Chandrasekharan, joining us here, the Vice President and Business Unit Head, ICT Practice, Minasa Region, Frost and Sullivan, leading this session for us. Everybody, another round of applause for all our speakers and our chairperson leading this session. Over to you, Mr. Benoy. Thank you so much. So good evening to everybody. I know this is the last session before the awards, so I know everybody will be waiting for that. So the, the organizers just said we have just half an hour time. So we were internally discussing how do we finish that entire, because we have such a big and eminent panelist. I first want to congratulate the, org the organizers who have really put up this panel, such a power-packed panel. So let me just start right into the discussion right now. So we have a mix of panel uh, from, for example, we have people, uh, we have, uh, uh, sorry, Himanshu from CRED, who is coming from a born in cloud company. He's a big finance, fintech organization. We have people from uh, Biocon, who has been a traditional organization, veteran leader in this space, and we have Jackson and we have Suma. So we have a mix of panels. So let me start with uh, Himanshu. So uh, CRED being a born in cloud company. So we all want to learn from you in terms of how do you deal with, so because cloud native applications and cloud native security is one of the most, most important subject in this market because the, the entire world is moving to cloud and the pace in which everybody is moving to cloud is really become very fast and which how do we manage the security in this entire thing. So let me start with you to explain about and to let us give some insight about what are the best practices which you follow in being in a born and cloud company. Great, thank you so much. Super privileged to be part of this panel. Thank you so much, Vinay. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so to start off, my name is Himansu and I'm um, part of uh, CRED. Um, we are almost close to five years old company, born out in cloud. Um, before I jump into the question of cloud native security, right? So uh, I want to start from very basic on um, how the whole ecosystem works in cloud, right? And um, the very first thing to understand and establish here is the shared responsibility on cloud, right? Uh, you have a cloud service provider, there are multiple cloud service providers out there in market. Um, and the first and foremost things to understand is what is the shared responsibility model in the cloud, right? What is that cloud service provider from a security standpoint, from a business standpoint is going to support you, right? Once we have established that, um, the second and um, um, most important thing is going to be um, to understand what we as a customer are responsible for on the cloud, right? And when you think about customer, um, again, I'll, I'll try to you know, break down things so that it's very simple, right? Uh, one is obviously the business aspect. Uh, the second is what is cloud providing, right? Um, on the business aspect, obviously the business uh, as a company, uh, we have seen that business wants to move very fast and uh, wants to keep up with the technology that cloud is going to provide, right? And um, there are always challenges in terms of uh, looking at business, different aspect of business, be it in terms of finance, be it in terms of uh, data, be it in terms of customers, right? So the whole business angle becomes very, very important. The second aspect is on the cloud part, wherein, you know, um, cloud has a lot of offering. Cloud has IAS, PaaS, SaaS, 
um, and and indeed it's very contextual to the company that you are in, right? And depending upon all these aspects, um, the whole security aspect or the security poster is going to change, right? And the third part on the cloud is basically on what is really cloud providing you, right? So uh, if you have to fundamentally look at things, cloud is providing us three things, right? Cloud is providing us compute layer, cloud is providing us network layer, and cloud is providing us data layer, right? So to start off with all these things, um, um, the security on all these aspects becomes very, very critical for all of us, right? Um, if you look at the compute layer, and then uh, on the cloud itself, there are multiple ways you know you can use compute layer, right? And uh, when you look at compute layer, the, the challenges it starts to emerge from there itself, right? And um, the way you basically look at business on the compute layer uh, is going to basically evolve, right? Um, earlier it was all VMs where you were using VMs a couple of you know a decade back or so, a couple of years back, and then um, you had like a managed services, right? Wherein Things like uh, Kubernetes, Fargate, all of these evolved, right? And slowly things are going into serverless mode, right? So the security landscape in each, um, um, be it on the VM, be it on the managed services, be it on the serverless, are uh, ever changing, right? Um, so there are always challenges in how do you basically manage these expectations and manage security on each of these uh, uh, changing landscape, right? Uh, the second part is on the network part of things, right? And that's where the um, the majority of problems are, right? And um, and there is no way to basically, you know, figure out uh, or basically protect uh, on the network side of things, right? There are so many challenges. There are open endpoints, and there are so many misconfigurations happening, and um, breaches are ever changing, right? Ever growing. You keep on hearing about a lot of cloud breaches because of misconfiguration, right? And at times, network becomes like one of the crucial, you know, uh, entry point to a lot of breaches that you have seen, right? So network, again, becomes like a, a challenging aspect on the cloud. The third and uh, most important part is the data layer, right? When in um, data at the end of the day for a lot of companies is going to be like the crown jewel, right? You want to protect your data, your customer data, your vendor data, your merchant data, uh, your finance data. So all of these actually plays a very, very important role. Uh, and, and when it comes to data, specifically in context of uh, reasons, right, be it uh, in context of India, be it in context of uh, outside of India, data sovereignty, uh, data governance, all of these uh, sort of plays a very important role, right? Uh, so ensuring you have a proper data protection controls in place, uh, again, becomes very, very critical uh, for any organization um, born in cloud to prioritize altogether, right? And, and I think uh, uh, we have panel member who can touch upon a lot on the data aspect uh, also, right? So I think these are my thoughts. These are the challenges I see at uh, in okay. the cloud, born of the cloud. These are the, some of the fundamental challenges that I have faced basically myself. And Thanks, Iman. I'll come back to you. Before that, I think let me, go, let me hear from uh, Jackson, who has been, I will call it a hybrid organization, uh, Bangalore International, uh, India International Airport. So I want to hear from you. How do you perceive this market, and how what is your journey in this, and what's the key advice that you want to give to similar companies like you. Thank you very much and uh, good evening everybody and uh, good evening to the rest of the panel members. Um, hybrid, proudly so and most likely will stay so. So that's first. Uh, I think uh, for, a, for a few organizations unlike uh, Himanshu who's born in the cloud and uh, growing in the cloud, some organizations will stay hybrid simply because the nature of the business that we are in requires us to be hybrid. So from that perspective, I think uh, Mr. Shetty, who was there before us, Nivea's wonderful presentation, I think he touched on a few of the reasons why uh, you know, organizations should not go to the cloud. I think because uh, to a certain degree, a percentage of organizations have glow, uh, grown, uh, sorry, gone to the cloud because of what uh, I think in the industry we call FOMO, fear of missing out. My neighbor was doing cloud, so I did cloud. Uh, everybody was doing cloud, I did cloud. So, and what happened is what Mr. Shetty very succinctly put up is that I, I took, I had an application here. I provisioned a workload up there. I shifted it up. So the entire lift and shift happened. And then when the bill came is when everybody's <laughs> reality sunk in. <laughs> So from that perspective, I think uh, we have taken a very uh, meticulous approach to see why do we need it on the cloud? 
is there a business case for it? I mean, is somebody going to be accessing it from somewhere else? I mean, if it is an internal system that nobody has ever, uh, we are going to leave a little outlier called the pandemic out of it because then you have other means of doing it and cloud is not the only answer there. But at the same time, a business uh, justification on why it has to be on the cloud is 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 a conversation that uh, not only uh, currently or even in previous organizations and for other organizations that they need to take for this so like i said uh, if it's more and the way we've approached it is actually quite simple not not uh, rocket science is it transactional does it have uh, quality conditions with regards to throughput and response times and everything, might as well see if you want to keep it on-prem. If it is more analytical nature, you know, you're doing big data and everything, then think about whether the cloud works for you. Again, this is from more a traditional organization perspective. And of course, everybody will have their own recipe to why they want to go to the cloud. I think this is my few cents on that. Okay, thank you so much. Now, Mr. Sarkar, uh, Biocon is a very large organization. It's a very traditional organization. I will probably call this a brick and mortar company which has grown from so small to become a very big, large organization. So from a very traditional organization, when you are getting into this, when you are getting into this cloud bandwagon, I am sure that type, you may have a lot of legacy applications. You have a lot of infrastructure which you already have, which is running on the legacy. How do you approach this? So I'm sure many of the audience also are in the similar scale, where we have many applications already in the legacy running on that. We should be moved. And what are the security things which I should keep in mind while in this transition and in this transformation? So first of all, good evening, everybody. And uh, I'm just too delighted to be here. And before I go ahead and talk anything about what I'm going to talk about, let me give a disclaimer. I'm not here to talk about Biocon but I'm here to take the learnings out of whatever we experience, and I'm going to share that with you. So uh, going to the cloud is, uh, is a journey. And like Jackson said, you know, the first question probably that a CIO should be asking is, do we need this on the cloud? And if you look at most organizations, uh, cloud journey started with O365, those who are on <coughs> Windows platforms, right? And that was probably a small step into what is now a larger whirlpool of cloud services. In every organization, you will see, uh, like what uh, you know, uh, he talked about, that there are uh, many different kind of services that come to you. So there is uh, software as a service. So you want to do something very quickly. Your ramp up time is very low. And your mm, yield to uh, benefit uh, rather, your reach to the benefit is, is very quick, and you want to do that. For example, if you want to, let's say, uh, onboard an employee in another country, and you want to do it in a space of a month, which otherwise would have taken few months, you can bring it down by outsourcing it to a company who's an expert at that activity. Right? So there's a benefit in there. But that also brings with it issues and challenges. And to a CISO, uh, there are many tools, so to say, you know. In Hindi, we say katputli. You know, so, so, so we are the ringmasters. We have to use all the resources at our disposal. And one of the biggest you know, resource that we have is called a contract. So when we sign up with somebody, we have to make sure that we are signing up with literal assurances in place. And there are two ways to do that. One way, you know, there are companies who come up with what is now called as a TPRM program or a third party risk management program. They have a questionnaire, they send it to the vendor, the vendor fills up the questionnaire, sends it back, and then somebody in the, after the review says, okay, so you have tick here and across here and you're okay to go or not okay to go. That's one way of doing it. The way that I have experienced gives better results is to begin with an open assurance. So I put it in the contract that says that you know, in the event that you have access to my data, you have to give me an assurance up front that you will protect it through reasonable security means. And in case you're not able to, you're willing to take a, a penalty or a hit for that. Only if you agree to that clause is when I go and then begin my assessment. So there is another clause which is about the auditability clause. 
So my first tool is the contract. My second tool is a pair of eyes which will now go and assess whether, so now the, the whoever I'm outsourcing to, whoever is my cloud partner, whether there's a, whether that is a cloud service provider or a cloud service consumer. I mean, we are consumers at the end of the day, but it's a chain, right? So, you know, so, so there is a data movement that happens. So I call it, you know, there are two ways to look at your data on how you want to, what you do with it. One is an aggressive data strategy, which means now you want to do something with your data. And the second is a defensive data strategy, which means you want to protect your data. See, in either cases, you want to know where your data is going. So the second thing that you want is technology that can tell you where the data is going and how you will evaluate it if that data is going. And I was talking, while we were talking and I talked about, uh, you know, AWS has features, something called as CloudTrail. Hmm. So I'll probably ask the vendor, have you subscribed to CloudTrail? If they have, it's, it's so easy, right? It's flip of a button. All that you need to is, do is pay for it. And you've got all the logs in place. So which means, if I have to go into discoverability in the future and do E forensics or something like that, because of a security breach, I will have make it easy. And and that's my second tool, technology, right? Because that's where I, I decide how do I protect my information. Uh, is a combination of a private access mechanism and you know secure serv you know what is called as secure. Uh, now it's called SASE also. SASE includes uh, SD WAN, but then there is also something called a secure service edge which means you put your network on the cloud and you are able to access it from anywhere. Mm -hmm. But to do that, there needs to be a, a discussion on technology. So my second tool is technology. Okay. And my third tool is to make sure that there is enough visibility and governance around it mm -hmm. so that if something goes wrong, I am able to you know, take necessary action to prepare against it. To, to you know, Jackson's point that you know, we didn't talk about COVID-19. One of the biggest learnings from COVID-19 is that when you are thinking about cybersecurity and, and, a, and a movement to cloud, you need to think about three things. One, have I got my defenses in place? And when I say defense, that includes my ability to monitor what's going on. So, you know, things like a SOC or a SIM or things, all those technological things. Do I have the ability to defend is my first question. My second question is something that I learned from, I mean, actually we learned it from SARS. Because I'm an old man and I have been there around when SARS was there. So that was my first pandemic. Okay. Right? One of the things that we learned in SARS is that you need to have the ability to withstand. So it's not like, you know, what most people talk, you know, if you get hit by this, you will recover in this way. But please understand that there is a period of time where, which you will spend under attack and you have to withstand that situation for some period in time. We learned from this pandemic, right? that the COVID-19 was not going away. The attacks were happening one after another, one wave after another. True. You had to stay at home. So, but we were not prepared for it. True. So, so, so that's my second point. We need to learn, we need to have strategies to withstand uh, if something goes wrong. So one, I have to defend, second, I have to withstand. And the third thing is to recover. Hmm. Now it's not always going to be that you're going to recover at the same place where you broke off. Uh, to give you a corollary, you know, it's like if you're, if if an if a building caves in, the New York uh, twin towers, they broke. Did they build the twin towers, hmm. or they, did they build something which was better than it, which is better than the twin towers, or is it something which is worse than the twin towers? Hmm. If you look at it, it is never going to be at the same level. It is either going to be better or worse. So your strategy in the beginning, before you did all these things was to figure out how much are you willing to invest in that recovery, mm. whether you're willing to take tangible losses or tangible benefits. Mm. Now, it's not going to work out every time, but it's a strategy, and that's how your investment will happen. And that is why when you move from a traditional organization to a cloud-enabled organization, these questions matter. Okay, so brilliant point, sir. So uh, I think you were touched upon a very important talks about risk and governance. So we have Suma with us. She is I'll call a veteran in the risk and governance part. She has, she's a CISO for one of our organizations in that space, and also CISO for Democrats Abroad. So being in an NGO, worked in NGOs as well as in the corporate, how do you deal with the risk and governance 
uh, from a compliance perspective and what are the best practices which we need to adopt? Thank you so much and um, good evening everybody. And this is a very interesting topic, risk and mitigation and also da data we know is the, is the currency at this point in time. So with the data being on the movement, data idle, you know, which is what we see on the cloud uh, all over the place, how do we mitigate and what kind of data loss can I, you know, is this acceptable? And uh, in an event of a breach, which is imminent, you know, clients, do I have the CIS controls in place? You know, uh, m most of the companies say, I don't have budget, what do I do? So you say, no, most basic. CIS controls, then go to um, NIST 800, and then let's start looking at building on top of it, and then incorporate the governance, you know, so most of, you know, many things, you know, so we can, we can capture human errors by automation, and then, um, and then the subsequent controls in place, so that should be able to, uh, you know, delegate quite a bit of risk assessment and risk, uh, monitoring and management. Okay. okay, so I think let me just go into some of the key challenges which we see in this cloud native security application. So I just want to probably start with one or two. One, of course, is visibility. So everybody says, if I have visibility, I know I'll be how to deal with it. Sometimes even I don't have visibility on what are the problems. So from a strategic perspective and from a tactical perspective, what are the, some of the best practices which you do to increase the visibility and deal with this visibility. Probably, Jackson, you can give your point. Anybody can probably pitch in in your own view. I'll start off and pass it. I think visibility is uh, like money. We want more. But uh, I know what I'll do if I have a million dollars. I know what I'll do if I have 10 million, 100 million. But I'm lost if I get a 10 billion. I don't know. I, my visibility was only up to 100 million. I don't know what I'll do with 10 billion. So I think visibility works a little bit that way, in the sense that what is it that you want to see, and what are you going to do with that uh, visibility? So from my perspective, and I think we discussed briefly on that, there are two, two ways I see visibility. One is what all is provisioned up there. When I say up there, I'm talking cloud. Uh, what all is provisioned up there for the organization? I mean, is it just those workloads which you initially thought, or did somebody else have access? Coming back to Suman's point, how many people have the access to create that up there? So, oh, sorry, I'm pushing the time. And the other one is, how many people can, from your employees, can go and just provision something on the cloud? I think those are the couple of things from a visibility perspective. I'm sorry, I'm cutting short. Uh, I'll just quickly add, um few more things, right? So uh, just adding on top of what Jackson mentioned, um, I think from a visibility, visibility point, um, you know, you have east-west traffic and north-south traffic, right? And largely, if you have to bring visibility or solve for visibility, then you need to have like a situational awareness within cloud, right? Uh, how is your data moving? How is your traffic moving within cloud? Um, what are the preventive controls? What are the detective controls? How you are going to react to a situation? And I think adding to, um, uh, Sarkar's point as well uh, in terms of having proper SIM and, uh, um, you, you know, uh, situational awareness in place. Like if there is an event that is uh, happening, uh, are you aware about that, right? Are you, uh, do you have like a velocity check in place and do you have, um, uh, are you aware about the whole data flow within your uh, ecosystem, right? So some of these points uh, again adds up to visibility in the cloud uh, when you're solving for visibility in cloud. Well, I know I don't have much time, I'll just take a minute. But uh, there is one area that has been a point of concern for ever since the internet has been in place. And uh, trust me, as I say this, uh, probably there is no one who's covered for this problem yet. And as we move more and more into cloud services, insecurity in DNS is going to be a major challenge. But there are not many who are focusing on it because in most organizations, DNS is something like, you know, uh, fill it, shut it, forget it kind of story, right? Once you have subscribed, it is over. But uh, trust me, uh, with the kind of weaknesses that are happening today and what will happen tomorrow, uh, more and more attacks are going to come through weaker DNSs. And those organizations who do not have a clearly segregated or demarcated area between the 
app between what you show to the internet and what you're doing inside, right? The attacks are going to be more and more uh, lethal, you know, effective, because they can get access very quickly unless you fix your DNS problem. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think I already got warning that we have already passed the time. So unfortunately, we couldn't cover a lot of, it's a very interesting topic. Uh, I think the time is a little limit. Thank you so much for all your valuable insights and thanks organizers for doing this.